Twitch is doing what it's supposed to. And then we will warm up and get started. All right, that looks good so far. Let's go ahead and open up the solution. And I'm just going to make sure I'm cozy. All right. Oh, hey, Smudge. Hey, Stu. left off. Oops, not sharp bots. Hold on. Sorry. Story box. All right. So doing things a little bit earlier tonight because I've got some uncancelable plans. So we are in the first semester and I noticed on the wiki that I've also added the advanced branch for Smudge and also linked to his Twitter for any of those who are curious or that I get a little bored by the the, the basic stuff we're doing here. Um, but speaking about that, I'm trying to keep, you know, active on the wiki page for um, things like code, videos, and also any kind of resources or things that I want to cover. I'm trying to be much more diligent about vocabulary. Um, the kind of idea behind this again is to create this course of factory patterns that you can move into right after um, going through the the the, uh, the learning suggestion in chat, it is C sharp fundamentals for absolute beginners. So ideally, you come from that, you come here, and you wouldn't feel completely lost. So I'm hoping that between best practices and vocabulary, when you open up the solution, there shouldn't be any new words, right? It should all feel like it's coming from the same from the same shared understanding. So, where we left off last time, instead of program, was we kind of cheated a bit and we started implementing the context pattern um, a little ahead of the game um, while we were doing the interpreter pattern. So, we've got a bit of a head start on the context object pattern. Um, and if you watched Smudge's video from last week, you definitely saw him talking a lot about the value of that um, the context pattern, where you're going to see it inside of the, the C-sharp framework. If you're doing anything with NBC or .NET 5, if you're picking around on O and you want to see how that works, you're going to run across this idea of an application context, an HTTP context, a controller context, a view context. Um, in EF, you're going to have your DV context. So just this this idea is, um, is prevalent, so, and it helps, it helps out a lot. We're gonna do a very basic implementation of it, and from my own description, a context is a container that logically groups related data, usually aware of what it's currently doing and what it's already done within reason. It provides a convenient, lightweight object that can be passed between tiers and modules. Um, so, pretty straightforward. And when we look at the one that we made last week, instead of our game context, we have the interpreter, we've got the game library item, we have the game, we have the player, we have the user input. So, I'm gonna put that, oh, and I'll just do this real quick. If I come under context object pattern, I've already filled out some of the, where to go for the pattern details. There's a good white paper from Vanderbilt University this is going to be a rant-heavy 
the stream. I should have warned about that. And then, uh, but here's a, it's, it's going to be a lot more information you probably need at this level, but it's a really good paper to keep on hand as a reference. Hang on. I see my name in black over in chat. <laughs> ah, yeah. Hey, Rob, from all of us here in chat. That was a, a request. Looks like Rob is doing some work in the background. Hmm. Well. In that case, I should make it very awkward and speak directly at Rob for for everything we say. Like, Rob would like this, or Rob, I'm really thinking about you when I when I go into this idea. Um, so, uh, the pattern details are there. Again, it's pretty good. Also, definitely deeper than you probably need. Um, and then, I started linking these guys. It's uh, Barbara Oakley has a tutorial on learning how to learn. Um, there's another great one called Stop Trading Water. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Stop Trading Water Learning to Learn. And they really kind of focus in on what one of the benefits of doing all these patterns is, which is to be able to bring a concept into your working memory, right? And there's some finer things in there I definitely encourage you to watch because it really kind of opens up the eyes to, to the journey of learning, especially with complex and, and, and layered things like this. Um, so once you're able to pull these patterns into your working memory, then you can use that loaded, um, chunk to then solve other problems, which is, is definitely, if you're ever in a boardroom and they're talking about requirements for a new project and there's some scene developer, somebody in the corner who kind of just does one of these for a second, does one of these again. And then says, I think we should model it this way. He's accessing that that working that working memory, right? And so he's look he's as people are talking, he's like, Oh, I'll use this pattern, I'll use this approach. And it's because he or she has done this so often that the complete thought, the complete um, idea along with any of its shortcomings, its pros, its complexities, its branching points, whatever have you, can be loaded up and then it can be applied. So if somebody in, in the room says, Hey, I want to, and this is coming off a, a really kind of uh, um, easy example, but if somebody said, hey, I want to create a, a website where people can come and buy cars, right? And the person's going to type in search criteria, and then that's going to create a profile for them. You're like, oh, create. That's a creational pattern. What pattern will I use for this? And as they keep talking, you keep willing through the patterns in your mind until you have the one you want to use. It's definitely a power, right? And so part of this course is to give you that power, is to be able to say, okay, if I have a problem, what tools can I use to model out the approach in my working memory? All right, so that's the first, that's kind of the rant. Uh, the first rant, speaking about these two videos, so really great to watch. The other one is the Feynman algorithm. Um, if you're struggling with learning all any of these concepts, the great... The great part about the Feynman algorithm is that it's it's hilarious, right? Because Richard Feynman was this brilliant physicist. And if you click on the Feynman algorithm, it says the first step is to write down the problem. The second step is to think very hard. And the third step is to write down the answer. So this works wonderfully for brilliant people. But for the rest of us, um, there's a whole lot more in this space as far as how we, we solve a problem. And a lot of it has to do with procedures and katas and modeling and writing down notes and, and, and slow thinking through these things. So for those of us who can't rely on being brilliant or extremely clever, there's what I'm hoping to be this kind of set of patterns that will help to, to give you that first step towards being able to think about a problem and then write down the answer. And then on the advanced branch, again, thanks, uh, big thanks to Smudge, and he's got videos as well, so they're great. You'll definitely see um, the next step of that, right? So these are kind of like your very basic patterns. And then you're like, well, what's the, what's the more advanced problem-solving, modeling, solution, architecting? Um, what are those topics? And 
Smudge is doing a great job of exploring those in the advanced branch of the same project. So that's pretty much it, really, for the rants. Okay. So, into the nitty gritty with the 30 minutes we have left. Man, this stuff moves so quickly. So, when we have our program, we have please type the name you want to play, the name of the game you want to play, and it gives you a prompt. And then we read the user input into our game context. And then we set a new interpreter. And then we call interpret on the context. And we pass in the context itself. So, and then for the game, we create that from the now loaded game library item. So the interpreter's job is to populate that game library item. And then we output to the user that we you chose whatever game you chose. So, how is that going to help us? Well, the, the one place where it helps immediately is that now that we have a context, now that we have an idea of what the, the primitive state of the application is, um, we can build off of that. And, and it's in one logical place where we can derive any other behavior we need. And what I mean by that is, let's expand this a little bit and move into um, something else we might want to do. So if I do console.writeline, please input player name, console.write that guy. And then I say context.player is equal to console.readline. So I'm assuming that this procedural order is going to happen without any incident, which is fine for right now. And I'll add a oops. A console dot right line again, just a blank line. And then I'll say, please type the game you want to play. So we have a game selection interpreter, which is, which is fine. Um, but we also want a player interpreter. Let's come over here to our interpreter folder. And let's go ahead and add a new item. I'm going to say player uh, name interpreter. Where's player interpreter? That way we'll, we'll be free later on in the naming. Um, if we want to add more complexity to this, we want to go back and change it from player name to player. So, so looking back on the interpreter pattern, Right, we've got this expression we're going to extend, this abstract expression. And do, 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 do. tell sense, this is not picking up what I'm putting down, which is fine. All right, so implement the missing members. And then I'm going to bring in the context. And the user input at this point is going, to, is going to contain the player name. So I want to do context dot player is equal to context dot user input. Pretty straightforward. Well, after I've processed, after I've interpreted the user input successfully, I come back over to expression. I've got this abstract class. I could do something within this, some built-in functionality, like clear out the user uh, input as soon as you do the interpretation. We don't need that anymore. We could also add that to some sort of logging, right? So inside of our context, we could say, but well, once we take, we want all user input to be recorded so that we might be able to play that back later. 
Um, so when we're interpreting things and we're inside the context, there's just two, there's, there's two kind of benefits we're playing around with. It's the ability to extend functionality and then the ability to have it be encapsulated in one place for easy use. And again, this kind of comes back to the idea of the context being something that should understand with, within reason its own state, which is, which is a name drop to next week's pattern, which is the state pattern. So I got this uh, player interpreter. And again, the simplest statements are still algorithms, right? So even though we're not really doing anything whatsoever, we're still deciding something. We're deciding that the user input is going to be applied to player, right? So this is, this is our decision logic, as simple as it might be. I wouldn't go bragging about that, though. If you're ever in a job interview and someone says, how much do you know about algorithms? I would not, I would not write on the whiteboard um, this statement and call it an algorithm. But, so, when we come back over to our program, well, I, I want to use the interpreter again. And I want to say that the interpreter is equal to a new player interpreter. And then I want to do context dot interpreter dot interpret. And now I'm passing the context. So as we've said in previous streams, um, you're always working towards, at least at this level, at, the, at this kind of junior, intermediate, or in my case, probably forever, you're always, at this point, you're kind of working out loud. And as you see your, your, your best practices and your, and your good code taking on very similar structure, you're like, ah, there it is. That's where I can refactor. And we, can, we can actually ask ourselves, well, what does refactoring mean? If all I'm doing is these steps over and over again, and they look very much the same, how can I abstract that problem into something that's more reusable and, um, and cleaner and easier to maintain? So all that's coming. So, but now I have a new interpreter, and I interpret the context, and now I should have a player name. So I should be able to do a console.writeLine welcome we'll output the player name here exclamation point because we're very excited to see these people context that player All right so let's make sure my yep still my center project so if I play this now I get please input player name and my player name is Gary I don't know why, but Gary is going to be the name I use for everything I do. All right, so then I get welcome. Ooh, and it's blank. So we'll go back in and we'll, we'll address that here in a second. Uh, what game do you want to play? Well, I want to play one. We don't actually know what we were, we're saying. We know that is. It's an enum. Ah, you choose Bubble Commander. All right, so let's go back in real fast and figure out... Oh, look at that. So I said the player was the read line. Silly, silly. This should be user input. Because again, I want to take in the input, pass the input to the interpreter, and rely on the interpreter to populate my, my player. Oop. And I'm going to do a chat break in a minute. So I'm overdue for one. All right, so welcome, Gary. Please type the name you, the game you want to play. One, you chose Bubble Commander. So there's some shortcomings here that we'll talk about towards the end because they really do segue nicely into um, the state pattern and being able to take all of this kind of decision logic and stuff it inside the context with a little more intelligent. So... I'm using the interpreter, I'm loading a game library, I'm also using the interpreter to load the player name. And I'm doing all this based off the user input. So for as far as being able to expand out on this project, even at this very, very early stage, I have the ability to say, okay, I can 
easily branch out and interpret different kinds of input, right? That leads us to the problem of, but how does the game context know what, intemp what interpreter to load? Or just what state to be in? And this is where the state patent comes in. We want to be able next week to be able to say, when the game context first loads, it's in an initiated state. And if it's in an initiated state, then the interpreter for the initiated state is the player interpreter. If it's in a game state, or a, a loading state, for example, so if it's in a loading state, we want the interpreter to be the game selection interpreter. And if it's in a game state, then we want to have a third interpreter. And so we want to be able to, to keep loading different types of interpreters based off of what input we're getting, and it's going to be derived from the state of the game context. Oops. Um, small break for chat. Twitch asks is a great question. Give me two seconds to make an adjustment in my environment, and I'll get to a question about am I using Real Studio 2015 or will I be migrating? Hang on. Sorry about that. If you guys can hear the fan noise, it's because it's particularly hot in my place today. All right, so I will be migrating to 2015. I haven't done so yet because I just went to 2010. I just installed some new video drivers. I was trying to limit, on this computer anyway, so I'm trying to limit the amount of change I throw at this guy um, in case of unforeseen results. Uh, but that brings up an interesting point from... Inside of uh, in, in Twitch's advanced stream, he saw something. I I wonder if I check, if I didn't check it in or maybe I didn't clean it up in time. So I was I'm running 2015 on a laptop and I'm also running StyleCop, and StyleCop um, wanted to start putting using statements inside my namespace. I just thought that's where it needed to go. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I actually don't see it. I wonder... Hmm. But I'll, I'll give an example. Because one of the... Switching over here for a second. Definitely brought up namespace here as one of the vocabulary terms. Just a really great time to just talk about what they are. Very, very briefly. Um, so, so, StyleCop really wanted me to put my using statements inside the namespace. And if you come over here to the wiki and click on namespace, it'll take you to a really good stack overflow just conversation about style cop doing these funny things and why it does it. Definitely a great read. Uh, at this level, I think one of the most pertinent takeaways was was this statement that when you do namespace with this convention, period, 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 it's entirely equivalent to doing it this way. Um, I'll let you dive into the the um, the hounds and the whys inside of the Stack Overflow climate, but it's actually it's it's really neat when you start thinking about um, where my using statements are. So if my using statement is here, the the anticipation is that it'll check these using statements before it checks for anything outside of the namespace. 
So if for whatever reason inside of system there was also an iGame context, it would be sure to check here first, right? Um, it's it's a it's a super small point, but it is it's it's. It's a distinction with a difference, right? Like it, it definitely lends itself to your understanding of how namespaces are composed and how using statements are um, are used when you're running an application. So, as far as being able to load up the project and really understand what every word is doing, don't cheat yourself from from that expertise. I guarantee you, for some of these things. Like come back over here for a second. Um, value versus reference. Add something on there for that, so you know when things are going to have their um, their assignments passed by reference. Also a great read, and I guarantee you, you're going to think to yourself, "I'm looking at this code, and we've really only used, let's say, 30 different keywords, right? Namespace, class, static, void, var." using, I guarantee you, if you just understand deeply what those 30 words mean, you're in a better place than most pretty accomplished developers, as far as really understanding your environment. So what I'm hoping to do is to keep throwing in those terms, at least as footnotes, so that if you have a question about anything you're seeing on the screen, there's going to be a, a link to some place to help out. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we are again. We're back inside of our main program. And again, we've got a console write line. We've got a read line that goes into user input. We're loading up an interpreter. We're interpreting the input. And then we're outputting what we know to be the result. So come back over into uh, I game contact. Just go into game context. So there really isn't much else that we want to do inside of the game context right now. But what we can do, hold on. Let me make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. We'll do this. We kind of fill out the game a bit, and this will lead us into what's eventually going to be um, our display system. Something very similar to Mudsy. One dot bubble commander. Two dot sin. This is all we really want to do. So, if we're looking at this in terms of its parts, we've got um, initial, a display of the state. User input, load interpreter, interpret user input, display output of interpretation. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, six steps are going to um, really decide the flow of our application right now. And if we come back over to our semester, we need to have some sort of state driving the decision making, and then eventually we'll have a, a chain of responsibility that moves us through each six of those steps. Okay. Not 
sure that I really want to do much more with the game library item, this little algorithm right now. Let's go ahead and do this. We'll do a, a region and we'll do um, properties. And for the last little, hey, just so you know what this stuff does, I got a link to the uh, to a a nice little MSDN article on properties. Just so you know what's happening here, right? This is what we're we're calling an auto property. Let's go ahead and click on that guy just to so just so you know what a property is. Really trying to slow down this time and make sure that we're all on the same page. A property is a member that provides a flexible mechanism to read, write, or compute the value of a private field. So right now you're already thinking to yourself, I didn't see a private field there. So starting in .NET 3.0, we've gained the ability to do auto properties, which previously you would have had to do exactly this, private double seconds, and then explicitly say that my goes and setters are going to do something with that private variable. Inside of auto properties um, and accessors, we can now ignore that requirement and .NET's going to know that this is what we want to do behind the covers and it'll take care of all of that, that auto wiring for us. This is, this is, it's important because if we look at C Sharp 6 property initializers, We've got this new funky syntax, right? So, and again, in terms of knowing the basics, understanding the language, you can now look at the three different representations of a property in C-sharp and be able to say, oh, you're explicitly um, declaring the getters and setters, the bodies of those functions. Um, this is probably previous to .NET 3.0, or you've got a really legitimate reason for needing that body. And if we see this syntax, we can say, ah, you must be using C sharp six. I'm sorry, I said .NET 2.0, I meant C sharp three. Don't hold me to that. Okay. So let's go back. So again, if you're going through these, the wiki, and I'll, I'll try to add links for all these things, the idea being that in all these sessions, she would walk away with it knowing, okay, I've got a pretty good idea what a switch statement is and how to use it. Dictionary, enum, interface. I understand value versus reference as much as I should or could at this point. Abstract, property, namespace. I'll keep adding resources like this. Okay, so back over to this guy. So I've got these properties. I'm using auto properties. So far, I don't have a need to, 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 to bake logic into this guy, right? And we start to see, um, if you look at the MSDN article and the limitations, once I do something with my getter, like if I say, I want to just return new, like that's just what I want to return every single time. By defining a body for the getter. My options are either to remove the setter entirely or give the setter a body. And there has to be something there. So before we get there, and we're gonna be using those things inside of our state pattern, it's definitely imp important enough if you're watching the video, take the time kind of understand what properties are and get the gist of how they've evolved, right? So that way, if you see some funky syntax, it's not gonna take you off guard. Okay. Let's make the program. Did I cover everything? I might've been too efficient this time. I'm always looking for ways to slim down the, the stream so I get everything in that 45 minutes. I might've done it this time. 
Okay. Let's do this. Let's take a quick look at what we have here and see if we can't enhance our game context without giving away the um, the pattern from next week. So if I added a body to this, and I got rid of the setter, and I said, and I put a switch statement in here, right? Or actually, I'll, switch. I'll do an if. To kind of give you the problem we're trying to solve, what I need to be able to do is I want to say, well, uh, if player, and it's a string, so we can say string dot is null or empty, player, return new game selection interpreter else return new player interpreter so on the surface this seems like it solves the problem right because then when I come back over here into my program I no longer even need this Seemingly, this is the smarter way to do it. It's an anti-pattern, and it's bad code, but this would work. I would be able to, to interpret, and then when it tries to access the interpreter, it would say that I don't have a player name yet, and it would return the player name interpreter. And then the next time it's called, it would see that um, I have a player name that's set, and it would return the, the game selection interpreter. A few problems with this. One, I'm newing up an object every time. And I'm making my, my logic dependent on something that might change in the future. It's, a, it's essentially an, a, a magic string. And I've limited the, my, the, the, the states that I can branch off of to just whether or not the player is set or not. So I am making a state-based decision, right? So I am saying, I know the players, if the player's not set, then I'm in a state where I need the player interpreter. Oops. I got that backwards, but it doesn't matter because it's, it's dirty and wrong anyway. But, and so this is in, at the, at the, at the further stretches of the, of, of patterns, we are making a decision based off state. And you will see code, bad code, that starts off with this really seemingly intelligent um, impulse, hits a brick wall, has to then branch its if statement, and it gets messy and unmaintainable. So we're trying to recognize this. We're trying to both recognize the problem that we need to solve and um, the better way to go about it and how common it is. Trying to decide what state your object or application is in is one of the fundamental problems you're going to run into writing code. So I'll get rid of all that. I'll still leave it up here in the properties. Let's do this. Okay. Do, 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 do. Man, there's so much I want to get into that I can't until next week. Okay, I'm going to add another interpreter. I'm going to call it the command interpreter. I'm kind of humming myself right now. Go ahead and fill this in. Put in okay, get rid of my unused using statements. And these should be the only three interpreters that I need for the entire game. I think. Oh, I'll do one more. I'm sorry. No, nothing. That's it. No apologies necessary. 
So if we come over to Storybox and we go to Brainstorm, Complexity and Scope. I'll try my best to keep updating this with thoughts so that I'm not just speaking from a vacuum. So that when you look at the code, you can say, where's this going and what's he doing? Uh, so right now we're talking about commands being a basic set, open, close, get, put, fight, talk. And if we look at the MUD-Z code, we've already kind of approached this, the ability to split up the arguments, right? So we already have a good idea of how to approach this algorithm. Then we have narrative items. These are items which only return more narrative for supported commands and trigger items. Interacting with these items might progress the story for better or worse. So we're going to have a very simple um, decision tree that we're going to be using for this. It's going to be, and I'll do this, you chose whatever, just give you kind of, an, we're just going to keep architecting this out in all the ways that we know right now. So again, very first step after doing the display output of interpretation is then to say display the current state, display for the current state. So I'm going to say um, please input a command. Console.write I'm going to do a console.user input is equal to console.readline. Oops, not console. Whoa, context. So doing the same thing I did up here, right? So we're doing the same thing over and over again. And you can see how we refrain from doing things like if statements in line or something like that, but this could get really dirty really quickly. But I think it definitely demonstrates the consistency of what we've done so far, that we are in fact moving from player interpreter, game selection interpreter, and then right here I want to do a context dot interpreter is equal to new uh, command interpreter. And then I want to do a context dot interpreter dot interpret and do a console dot right line mm. we don't really know what to do here so coming into the context what is this command interpreter going to populate we can go ahead and do that now, and this will hopefully fill out our game context with everything we need to move forward. So, we will do, hmm, I need to limit it, but inside of common, I think, I think, I think. I would do add a folder and I'll call it, oops, Ugh. I think instead of loader I already has something that would do that. Game, game library, hmm. I'm gonna do it here. I might change it. Nine tenths of all programming is naming things. I've heard that many times. So I'll do uh, command type. And I'll make this a public enum. I'm just going to start get, put, open, close, speak, ask, fight. All right, so these are going to be our command types for our interactive fiction game. So we're going to type in get target. Put, target, open, target, close, target, speak, target, ask. You get the idea. Ooh, and we're out of time. Arr. First I'm bumbling around and then I'm out of time. So I'm going to do command type. I'm going to say 
current commands. Right? So now in some, some of my game text context, we're starting to see not only what the game context is going to be comprised of, but also once we get into the game, we're going to kind of enter into this loop, right? So we're going to take in a player name, take in a game selection, and then start processing commands. And then when we start processing commands, we're going to start iterating through the game's narrative logic, right? So we're going to have all of this business logic and core that really decides, okay, what does this command do? If I put the book on the shelf, does it just return back narrative or does it return back narrative and advance the story? So a pretty simple decision tree and ultimately a pretty cool example. But right now what we're looking at is we've got a problem with state because we don't want to keep doing this, right? We want to have a better way of handling our application architecture. And then we also want to derive that the beginnings of our application engine, right? So that chain of responsibility. How do we loop through all of these states in the normal flow of the application? So I'm going to go ahead and check all this in. I think we've, we've stayed on track and covered some really good stuff. Um, i got to focus here. You know, smudge will kill me. I'm going to commit. Yeah, actually, if you want to believe this, go back and check out his last video. This, this character, this joker, had instructions for me at the end. It was incredible. I'm looking at you, Smudge. And you, Rob. Look at you too, Rob. Wherever you are. In the ethers. And I've not even looked at... I have not even looked at uh, chat in some time. Time... Yeah. The whole hours move so fast. Okay. So, I'm just going to do context pattern. And I'm going to commit it. I got one untracked file. I'm going to go ahead and add that. Look at me, Smudge. I'm saying it out loud. I'm saying it out loud so I don't miss a step. Untracked files are gone. Everything else looks good. And all this is so clean, by the way, because Smudge did the due diligence of applying the application, uh, the, the solution structure, and the git ignore files. I'm going to commit that. Right, which commits all those things locally. And I'm going to go ahead and sync it. And sync it. Conflicts. Hold on. Ah. I think that's fine. Does all look good? I think it looks good. All the conflicts are resolved. I'm going to go back in. I'm going to go ahead and merge this guy. So I'm not gonna. I'm gonna spare you this, right? At some point, through all the craziness, on some of my boxes, you can see this stuff. I'm gonna spare it for you, but I'll clean it all up and I'll go in there and we'll be good to go. And then on Smudge's advanced stream, they'll probably go into all this fun stuff. At some point, I'm gonna win, but at some point it's gonna happen and he's gonna tackle it. But for you guys in the basic stream, probably a bit too much for right now. But I'll take care of these four conflicts and we will see you guys next week. But we'll come over here just to make sure. Yeah. So once I push that, all this will update, and we'll be good to go. So expect to see that in the next 10 minutes. Um, thanks, everybody, for hanging out. And while I'm doing this, I'll be in chat. But otherwise, I will see you next week.